responsibility to see the world, but also to reach the world for Jesus Christ. If you, take, if you have your Bible there this morning, I want to invite you to take it and turn to the book of Acts as the kids are being dismissed to Children's Church. I also would invite you to pull out your bulletin. Uh, we started about a month ago a series of messages about the church on purpose. And we've been reminding you from the scriptures what God says is the purpose of a church. And I'm very thankful that years ago, First Baptist Church put together a purpose statement that you find on the back of your bulletin. It's there for a reason, to remind us on a regular basis why we are doing what we are doing, why we have church in the first place. And so this message series, series of messages is designed to be a reminder to us from Scripture. It's not just because it's on the back of the bulletin that we do this. It's because God's Word tells us to. And so I want to invite you this morning to do as we've done the last few weeks and read with me the purpose statement that's in the box on the back of your bulletin. Read that together in unison. First Baptist Church, with its rich spiritual heritage and balanced biblical ministries, strives to honor God through vibrant, contagious worship, penetrating evangelistic outreach, compassionate, caring fellowship, and dynamic, servant-producing discipleship. And I would add to that all to the glory of God. And so this morning, I invite you to consider this topic of vibrant or, or penetrating evangelistic outreach. We've looked at vibrant, contagious worship. We took three weeks in Psalm 33. If you didn't happen to be with us, I would invite you to go back and listen to those messages via our church's website. But today, I want us to move on to this next statement in our purpose statement on the church on purpose, and that is that we would want to be a, a penetrating evangelistic kind of church with penetrating evangelistic outreach. And if there's any verse in all the Bible that I think encapsulates that concept, it's found here in this one verse in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And I don't want to just jump into that verse. I want to give you the context of it It's in, in its entirety this morning. So I invite you to take your Bible and read with me Acts chapter 1 beginning in verse 1, and we'll read down through verse 11, and then we'll spend the majority of our time this morning studying and thinking about what Acts chapter 1 verse 8 specifically says. Acts 1 beginning in verse 1, the Bible says this, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the, the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by him, by them in white apparel, who said also, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in, so, in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Let's bow before the Lord for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this, what is probably a fairly familiar passage of Scripture this morning that gives to us our marching orders, gives to us our instructions, the final words of Jesus before he ascended into heaven to tell us why he's leaving us behind and what it is he wants us to do in terms of being witnesses unto him here in our own area, but also to the end of the earth. Thank you, Lord, for the way the church has fulfilled that in some eras successfully and marvelously, in other eras practically not at all. I pray that as we live in 2016 in Lorain County, Ohio, that we would want to be a part of you doing in a mighty way 
what you intended the church to always do, and that is to be a witness for Jesus Christ and to take the gospel into his, even we had portrayed before us in drama, to be the lights that you designed for us to be. Lord, help us to see that mission and help us to fulfill that mission that you've given to us as a church. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. We've read the text this morning and been reminded of the context in terms of what the book of Acts is all about, that this is after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we have this account of, of what Jesus says to his disciples before his ascension, and then the account of the actual ascension itself. I think it's interesting, as you read the scriptures, what, what happens in verse 6, in verse 6 where the Bible says, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Have you ever asked the wrong question? Have you, I mean, seriously, have you ever asked the wrong question? When I was younger and perhaps more foolish, I used to ask my wife, why are you grumpy today? Um, probably I still occasionally think that thought, but I, I discovered that's really not the right question, okay? It's not the best question to ask anybody, especially your spouse. But really what the disciples are doing here is they're asking Jesus the wrong question. What they're saying is, is do you, are you going to establish the kingdom now? In other words, do we get to rule with you? I mean, is all this tough stuff that we've gone through over the course of the last three years and, and your crucifixion and, and you were buried and you rose again and, and all that, is the kingdom going to start now? Do we get to rule with you, Jesus? It's really the wrong question. Notice how Jesus answered, answers it. He says, you know what? It's not for you to know the times and the seasons and all those types of things. And then he says, I have something far more important for you to do than to rule the world with me. Instead of rule the world, my mission for you is to reach the world. And that has been his mission for his church and for the people of God ever since. Not to, to rule the world, but to reach the world. Not even to, to be re rescued from the world, but to reach the world. That's Jesus' mission for us as a church. And Jesus' mission for us as individuals that fits so well with what our purpose statement is here at First Baptist Church. The second of our purposes being to be a, a, a church of penetrating evangelistic outreach that is fulfilling God's mission to reach the world for Jesus Christ. And so this morning, I want you to notice three different ideas that Jesus gives us to us here as a disciples who are called to penetrating evangelistic outreach. Notice those three ideas. First of all, the power for witness, as it's described there in Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 8, where Jesus says this. He says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And I want you to think about this in two different ways. First of all, the nature of this power, the word that Jesus uses there when he says you're going to receive power it, it is a familiar word to a lot of us in that it's the word that we get our word dynamite from. It's the word dunamis. And it, and it means I'm going to give you strength. I'm going to give you ability to accomplish the task that I've asked you to do. And so when Jesus says I'm going to give you power, He's saying, I'm going to give you the enablement, divine ability to accomplish this task. And so for the church and for us as individuals, Jesus is not asking us to do an impossible task because he's promising us the power to accomplish it. And the Holy Spirit is that power. Notice how the text even states it when it says this, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And of course, that was something that they were looking forward to and, and not the too distant future. Acts chapter 2, you have the fulfillment of that and the coming of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the, the beginning of the church age as the Holy Spirit came upon his, belie his believers and his followers. And so God left us with the Holy Spirit to enable us to do what he's asked us to do. The nature of that power is that it's Holy Spirit power. But then secondly, notice also the significance of that power. Jesus was commanding them to do something that they could not do without his power. I mean, think about the task of, of reaching the, the globe for Jesus Christ as we will look into and study together this morning to take the gospel from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That's an impossible task of left on our own to try to accomplish it. And so Jesus gave them the Holy Spirit and has given us the Holy Spirit to be able to do the job of worldwide evangelism. 
Have you ever been asked to do something that you had no ability to do? I mean, think about your life. Has there ever been a, ever been a time in your life when you've been asked to do something that you really had no ability to do? Um, I discovered one of my lacks of ability, I guess, to put it that way, when I was in high school. My, my dad and I are, are completely different in our personality and our giftedness and our skill sets. And yet, as any good dad, you always want to teach your son to be able to, to do things that you know how to do. And so I remember my my dad and I, I remember my, my buying my first car, okay? I bought my first car, and I had engine problems almost immediately. By the way, I should have known better. When I bought the car for $600, and the tax title and license came to $666. I mean, my car was a 666 car from the very beginning. And so... My dad being a mechanical kind of guy that was accustomed to fixing things and repairing things said, well, that's no problem. Your car needs a valve job. And so you and I, we're going we're gonna to tear it apart and we're going to do this valve job, have the valves ground, take it into machine shop, all that kind of stuff. And it sounded like a pretty simple type of thing, by the way, my dad presented it, you know, we can do this. And so he helped me take apart the head of the car and and it was all, I mean, the taking apart thing was okay. I'm good with that, okay? I can destroy things very, very well. But then it came time after the, after the valves were fixed, everything was fixed, it came time to put it back together. And my dad said, okay, there you go. I'm like, there you go. Yeah, dad, what do you mean by that? He says, well, just put it back together. And I was like, I don't know how to put it back together. He said, well, you took it apart. I said, well, that doesn't mean a thing to me. I just took bolts out. I mean, I just took it all apart. I don't know how it goes back together because in his mind, it was as simple as if you took it apart, you would know how to put it back together because of the mechanical nature of his mind and his abilities. He knew how to do this. He had the ability to do it. I had no ability to do it. And so I remember literally just looking at my dad. I mean, like, I'm so stupid, dad. I know I'm so stupid. I did not inherit your, your mechanic genes, okay? I didn't get any of that. And my dad finally just said, okay, fine. Then he said, you help me. And so here I am literally handing him bolts and wrenches and he's putting it all together. He's like, oh, see here, it's so simple. And the whole time I'm just going, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. Because I was being asked to do something that I had no ability to do. Aren't you thankful that God didn't leave us that way with the gospel? That he didn't just say, okay, now go out and be witnesses and reach the world for Christ and good luck with that. No, he said, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit who's going to enable you to be witnesses and to share this good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about our abilities. It's about the ability of the Holy Spirit to take the word of God in, into the heart of a person and change their lives through the gospel. I'm so thankful for that because the power is not about me. The power is not about you. The power is about God and the enablement that he has given to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, the source of the success of the, of the early church was the Spirit of God. And if we want to reach our neighbors for Christ, if we want to reach our world for Christ, we have to realize that that same secret of success is the Spirit in the 21st century as well. It's not, no, no, no amount of, of clinics and committees and other types of gimmicks and things like that will accomplish anything apart from the working of the Spirit of God. Now, there's nothing wrong with those things. Don't misunderstand me. But ultimately, it's not by our might, it's not by our strength, but it's by His Spirit, saith the Lord, as the Old Testament prophet put it. And so God has given us the power of the Holy Spirit. I like the way Warren Wiersbe puts it when he says the following, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is not a luxury, it is a necessity. You see, nothing of, of lasting spiritual significance, significance is accomplished apart from the working of the Spirit of God in the hearts and lives of people. And so while I'm encouraged by that, on the flip side, you know what else that means to us? There really are no excuses for us to not be witnesses. There are no excuses for us to not let our light shine brightly for Jesus Christ, because he has given us the power. He's given us the Spirit of God. We have the supernatural power to tell other people about Jesus Christ. And if we cower from that in fear, that's really a lack of faith in the power of God. It's his power that enables us to accomplish this mission. 
And so we have a power for witness. But then secondly, I want you to also think about the people then for witness. As they're described here in verse 8 again, as you continue on in the text, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me. So who are the people? It's us. It's his children. You shall be witnesses to me. I'm thinking, think about this in three different ways. First of all, think in terms of the simplicity of witnessing. Just the, the very word that God the Spirit chose to use. Here's an interesting one. He, he refers to us as witnesses. Uh, someone telling someone else what they have experienced. I mean, we think of it in terms of, of courtroom type of setting. Somebody being placed on the what stand? The witness stand. What are they asked to do? They're asked to recount to the lawyer or whoever it is that's asking the questions what they went through, what they experienced, and they're asked to do so in a truthful manner to just simply witness to what it was they experienced. That's the term that God uses for us in terms of the spread of the gospel. I know he uses other terms, evangelize and preach, and those are very fitting terms as well, but in this context, he uses this term of witness. You shall be witnesses. And so it's this beautifully simple idea of you just simply tell the truth about Jesus. You just simply tell the truth about who he is and what he's done for you in saving your soul and, and the truths about him that make that all possible. You, you tell the truth about Jesus. You witness. You tell the truth that Jesus is the sinless son of God. You tell the truth that Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. As the sinless Son of God, he came to be the sacrifice for our sin. You tell the truth about the fact that he's the only way then, as a result of that, as a sacrifice for our sin. He was the only one who could die in our place to, to make the payment for our sin and, and offer forgiveness to us. You tell the truth about the fact that he was buried and that he rose again, triumphant over death and over the grave. And that now he's in heaven interceding for us. And you tell the truth that Jesus is the only way to God the Father. He's the only way to eternal life. And if a person will simply repent of their sin and place their faith completely and solely in Jesus Christ for salvation, they can have the forgiveness of sins. That's the gospel witness in a nutshell. And that's what I trust has happened in your heart. Because in order for you to be a witness, that has to be true of your life. There has to have been a time in your life when you came to that realization that you were a sinner, and as a sinner you were separated from a holy God for all eternity, and you came to realize that Christ paid the price on Calvary's cross for you, and you repented and you placed your faith in Jesus Christ and received the free gift of eternal life. Have you done that and received Jesus Christ's forgiveness? If you have, then you're a witness. In the, in the most simple sense, witnessing is just telling to other people what Jesus has done for you and who he is and what he's done for you and how he can do the very same thing for them. And so the beauty of the witness is that it's really simple. Are you telling somebody else what Christ has done in your life? But then secondly, I also want you to think about the significance of witness because this terminology is, is used all over the book of Acts. The, the, the history of the early church, the New Testament church and its birth and, and youthful stage. You have all over the pages of the book of Acts this word witness or witnesses. Some 39 times one of the versions of this word is used in the book of Acts. In places like Acts 2.32, this Jesus God raised up of which we are all witnesses. Acts 3.15, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. Acts 10.39, and we are witnesses of all things which he did. And so a thriving New Testament church is a witnessing church that wants to tell other people about what Jesus Christ has done in their lives. May we be that kind of church, the significance of witnessing. But then thirdly, also think in terms of the certainty of witnessing. Notice, notice how Jesus puts it here. He says, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be witnesses. And so the certainty of it is this, that every Christian is a witness. Every professing follower of Jesus Christ is a witness in some way, shape, or form. Unfortunately, a lot of Christian witnesses are, are, are pleading the Fifth Amendment, so to speak, trying to be silent 
in their witness, when in reality there's no such thing as a silent witness. Every Christian is a witness of one kind or another. Think of it like this. Think of it in terms of where you may be today versus where God wants you to be when it comes to witnessing. I like to think of witnessing in terms of, of levels, levels of witness for the Christian. First of all, there are people that, that are a witness in all the wrong ways. In other words, people that name the name of Christ and whose lives don't back up in terms of obedience, in terms of lifestyle, in terms of godliness, they don't back up their they're saying that they're followers of Jesus Christ. But in a sense, they are witnesses. They are witnesses who profane Christ, who make the testimony of Christ look horrible and, and really make Christianity look horrible because they say one thing and they live completely differently. But that is a witness. It's not a good witness. And so today, if, if you're someone who says you're a follower of Jesus Christ and that you've trusted Christ as your Savior and your lifestyle is the opposite of that, God wants you to change that lifestyle and repent of that lifestyle and turn back to living a consistent Christian testimony so that you can be a good witness with credibility. You know what it's like in the courtroom when, when somebody stands up and testifies and the prosecuting attorney then gets the opportunity to ask lots of tough questions and all of a sudden the, the jury just begins to wonder about the credibility of this witness and they end up just in their mind completely dismissing the, what that witness has said because there's no credibility of witness. Well, there are a lot of Christians that have no credibility of witness because they're not living out the Christian life, but they are still witnesses. And if that's you today, God wants you to change that. So there's, there are those who profane Christ. There are then secondly those who profess Christ. And that's the next level in the sense of, by that I mean that you are willing to say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, and you are in, in some way, shape, or form professing that and, and striving to live that out in your life. Do you realize there are a lot of Christians who don't want anybody to know they're a Christian? So have you walked into their workplace or into their neighborhood or other settings um, if I walked in and started to ask people what they were like and what, how they lived, people would be surprised that I was their pastor and that they were Christian and they'd go to a church and all those kinds of things. Maybe they don't live in blatant sin in terms of like the first one, but they've not yet really professed Christ and saying, you know what, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm a Christian. And, and so what a shame it is for people to live, and unfortunately, there are a lot of Christians that live a large portion of their Christian life this way, of being scared to tell anybody that they're a Christian. That's a witness. Again, not what it ought to be, but God wants you to profess Christ. God wants you to, in your context of your world and your life, say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Profess Christ. And then thirdly, the third level is to proclaim Christ to get beyond the first two and to be a person who begins to tell others about Christ in some way, shape, or form. Maybe it means giving out gospel tracts. Maybe it means uh, inviting people that don't know Christ as their Savior to church and special, especially evangelistic types of functions like Memorial Day service coming up next Sunday or Christmas musicale or, or Upward or something like that. Maybe in, in some way, shape, or form, they're trying to proclaim Christ. Again, you see the progression and then the last one is to present Christ. And I would submit to you that this is where God wants us all to, to, to get to, okay? In the sense that present Christ means that, that you're someone who actively presents the plan of salvation and, and gives the gospel and, and tries to lead somebody to saving faith in Christ. And, and this is really where God wants all of us as, as followers of Jesus Christ to, to move past the other possible stages to the point that, that if somebody said to you, somebody walked up to you today and, and they said, I don't know how to get to heaven. How can I get to heaven? Could you explain the gospel to them? Could you present Christ? Or if that doesn't happen, because that's not a common thing, as you interact with other people, could you concisely and compellingly explain to someone how they need Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and explain to them how they can be saved. You know, as a church, we, we realize people are at different levels and there are different opportunities along the way. But for us as a church to present Christ, there are a number of things that we're doing to help train you to do that. Our evangelism explosion ministry is designed to do that, to make it so that you know how to clearly and concisely and compellingly 
explain the plan of salvation to someone. We have the exchange Bible studies, which are in a, a different, different format. It's designed to be a Bible study, a relational, in the context perhaps even of a home where you can walk through four different Bible studies through the exchange Bible study ministry to, again, present Christ and, and, and opportunities like that because ultimately God wants us all to be at number four we, we, where we are consistently, actively presenting Jesus Christ to someone else. Because he's called us to be a people. A people for witness. A people for witness. Where are you on this plan of levels? Are you a one? That needs to change. Are you a two? That's a good start. Profess Christ. But then start proclaiming Christ and ultimately present Christ. Give people the gospel so they can be born again. And so the people for witness. And then thirdly, notice this morning... The plan then for witness. The plan is this. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And, and I can't help but think back to, to our title this morning and our purpose statement in that we want to be a church where, where there's penetrating evangelistic outreach. That's this idea. Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the end of the earth. That's penetrating gospel witness. And, but there's a, there's a tendency for us to just think of that in terms of a map. And this map kind of will show you what Jesus was alluding to. And Jerusalem, you have in the middle near the bottom there. And that's where it all started in terms of that's where Christ was crucified. But Judea and then to the north, Samaria. And, and the end of the earth, of course, would, would cover the entire globe. But Jesus was saying more than just regional evangelism. Okay, Jesus actually, if you had been one of the disciples that heard Jesus say these things, you probably would have been shocked by what he was saying. Why? Well, because of, of the significance of, of the meaning of each of these. First of all, notice that what Jesus was saying here is that he was saying, start at home. That, that's Jerusalem. But again, think of that in the context of what they had just been through. What happened in Jerusalem? Jesus had just been killed in Jerusalem, right? And so for Jesus to say to them, now, you go tell this message right where I just died and was buried and rose again, do, do you think that that would have been a pretty big deal to them? I mean, they couldn't have helped but thought, well, hold it, now, can't we go somewhere else where maybe they aren't quite so hostile to you because couldn't we face the exact same thing that you faced if we preached the gospel there? And so I really think that these statements were more than just regional. They were really shocking, and Jesus was calling them to a, a radical kind of Christianity where they were willing to, to give all and sacrifice all if necessary to take the gospel there. And so Jesus was teaching them that and teaching them to start at home, that even though they could face the very same type of demise that he faced, that they would be bold in their witness and that they would reach their, their world before they tried to even reach the world. And that's important for us as well. There are a lot of churches and Christians today that want to reach the world to the ne neglect of their world. I mean, a lot of churches that give a lot to missions and maybe even individuals that give a lot to missions and, and, and do so out of a motivation to kind of soothe their conscience that I'm doing my part. I, I don't want to ever say anything about Jesus Christ to anybody, but I'll give to the offering. You see, Jesus wants us to reach our world before we reach the world. Start in your Jerusalem. And every one of us has our own world, our neighborhood, our family, our workplace, our friends that need Jesus Christ. And, and we have a Jerusalem to reach. We have a Jerusalem in Elyria, Ohio. In Lorain County, Ohio. 300,000 people in our county. How many of them know Christ? How many of them are yet to hear a clear presentation of the gospel? And one of the things that God's been burdening my heart for is, is that, especially people and neighborhoods where maybe we've done nothing to reach that neighborhood for Christ. You know, one of the things that I think about is how God has scattered us all over Lorain County and some beyond Lorain County in our church. But what about places where none of us live? What about the parts of Elyria that maybe aren't as nice as they once were? Are we reaching places like that with the gospel of Christ? At Holmes Baptist, where I was a pastor before the Lord called me to faith and then to hear, um, 
God put that burden on my heart for us to take the gospel to every home in the county. And it took seven years, and we didn't go to every home in terms of if there was a church right there in that community, one of our sister churches, we felt that was their responsibility. But over the course of seven years, we tried to knock on almost every door in, in Wright County. And I know it was a rural county in northern Iowa. It's not the same as Lorain County. But, and we would, before we knocked on the door, we would mail a gospel tract with a letter explaining we were going to come and stop by and, and would love to have a conversation with them about eternity. And, and I can't help but wonder if, if that's not what God wants us to do here at First Baptist as well, especially in the neighborhoods where maybe none of us live. Who's reaching them for Christ? How good of a job, how thorough of a job are we doing of reaching our Jerusalem? Starts at home. Starts at home. And so the plan for witness is that it starts at home, but also the plan for witness is that it, it, it supersedes all boundaries. And again, this is that shock factor here. That This was not just, oh, okay, Jesus says, go to Jerusalem, go to Judea, Samaria. No, this was probably a very shocking statement to the disciples because he says to them, Judea, again, that was where Jerusalem was. That's where Christ had been rejected. Not exactly a, a, a friendly place to Jesus Christ. But then on top of it, he says, Samaria. Samaria? Again, I'm going to test your Bible knowledge a little bit here. But do, do, you, do you know the significance in terms of the conflict between the Jews and the Samaritans? They hated each other. I mean, talk about racial issues and racial division. And it wasn't just racial, it was also religious in nature. In that Samaria, when the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom split under King Rehoboam, eventually the, the northern kingdom got away from God first before the southern kingdom did, okay? And the Assyrians came in in, in 722 and invaded and, and destroyed the northern kingdom. And, and they ended up deporting a large portion of the population. And then on the flip side, they also imported a large portion of other people from other regions and other areas that, that came in. And what happened is because of the, of the compromise of, of the northern kingdom, they intermarried with people that were completely unbelievers, okay? And so violated God's plan for, for the Jewish nation to remain pure and it became a, a cross-section in terms of race that then the Jews looked down upon because of the disobedience of that. And there was this huge amount of racial tension as a result of it. And it wasn't just racial, it was also religious and that the Samaritans then, because of all this tension, formed their own kind of branch of Judaism. And they even built their own temple. They weren't going to go down to Jerusalem anymore. They were, and so they doctrinally went off as well as a result of that. And so there's this massive division between the Jews of the South and the Samaritans of the North. And as a matter of fact, that when Jesus talked to a Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, do you know what that Samaritan woman said to, her, said to him? Why are you talking to me? Jews have nothing to do with Samaritans. She was shocked that Jesus would even talk to her. That, that's how thick the, the, the tension was between the Jews and the Samaritans. And yet, what does Jesus say here? Go to Jerusalem and Judea and what? Samaria. Why? Because they need the gospel. You see, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ has no racial, it has no political, it has no socioeconomic or geographic limits. God wants the gospel everywhere to everyone, no matter what. That's the nature of the gospel. I think it's interesting that, that the, the, the Jewish disciples, I think, had a hard time swallowing this pill. Why do I think that? Because you don't see them doing it until they have to. As a matter of fact, you read the book of Acts, and it wasn't until Acts chapter 8 that all of a sudden they started taking the gospel to Samaria. And what had just happened? Persecution. And the stoning of Stephen caused the disciples to spread out all over the place. And then guess what happens? They actually start taking the gospel to Samaria. There was such hesitation to spread the gospel. God forbid that it would take persecution of our church or in America to make us really spread the gospel like we ought to but it's possible god wants us to take the gospel to everyone god wants us to evangelize every person 
in our area. No matter where they are ethnically, no matter where they are socioeconomically, no matter where they are in terms of life situation and geographically, we have a responsibility to reach our Jerusalem, our Judea, and our Samaria. And so what does that mean? First Baptist Church ought to look more like Elyria, Ohio. In terms of race, in terms of socioeconomic class, there should be no barriers to us reaching our area for Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus is saying. We need to look more like Illyria because we're doing more to reach Illyria. We've placed a, a greater emphasis here at First Baptist on evangelism recently, and that's, I trust, just the beginning of us hopefully developing a culture where we all see ourselves as witnesses to reach our area for Christ. Upward launches on Wednesday night. And I hope up, Upward is a cross-section of Illyria, not just the suburban fringes that many of us live in, but a cross-section of Illyria because we're reaching boys and girls and moms and dads for Jesus Christ from all over our community, our Judea and our Samaria. And so it supersedes all boundaries. And then finally, it is then also supplied by the surrendered. And, and you may look at that and say, well, where do you get that from the text, Pastor? Well, think about it like this. And to the end of the earth. That's a big deal. I mean, it's one thing for me to witness in the neighborhood I grew up in and, and maybe the area I live in and not have to change my life circumstance or life situation and just kind of stay at home. But it's another thing for somebody to go to the end of the earth, to the end of the world. And what that requires is surrender. And it doesn't just require surrender on the part of those that will be called to go to the end of the earth, like like our missionaries today and like the Warners to Romania who are here with us this morning. It doesn't just require surrender on their part, although it does. You realize it requires surrender on the part of not just the goers. It requires surrender on the part of the, if I can use this term, stayers too. Because what will propel them to the Dominican Republic? And what will enable the Warners to stay on the field in Romania and others that God right now is in the process, I trust, of calling to the mission field as well. It'll take givers. So it's not just about goers, but it's also about givers. And, and let me ask you this question in relationship to that. Does Christ ask any less in terms of sacrifice? Does Christ ask any less of the givers than he does of the goers? Does Christ ask any less of the givers than he does of the goers? He doesn't. Now, their sacrifice might look different in terms of being willing to go to the Dominican Republic or being willing to go to Romania or someone else to some other end of the earth type of thing. It may look different, but you know what? The call is the same in terms of sacrifice. And our commitment to worldwide missions and worldwide evangelism needs to be just as great. And it may mean for us that, that I witness in my neighborhood and I take the gospel in my neighborhood, but it also may mean that I give because I want to make it so that they can then go to the end of the earth to fulfill this mission that God has given to them. And so I need to set, be willing to sacrifice just as much. It may look a little different, but the sacrifice is still significant if we really believe this is God's plan for the church. Last year I read, and, and we're independent Baptists, so we don't do missions the same way as the Southern Baptists do. But last year I read an article about the Southern Baptist International Mission Board who had to cut 600 missionaries and staff members because they were faced with a $21 million deficit. What is that a reflection of? And I know there may be a number of contributing factors to that. But what's that a, what is that a reflection of? It's a reflection of an unwillingness on the part of the givers to sacrifice for the sake of the gospel so that people can go to take it to the end of the earth. And so the sacrifice is still significant. It's still significant and it's still vital that every one of us see the importance of what Jesus has called us to do. Chuck Swindoll years ago preached a sermon from the book of Acts and he told, and he told a story about a, a man by the name of Necheyev 
And he was, a, he was a 19th century follower of the doctrines of Karl Marx. So you know his persuasion politically. He was involved in, the role, in a role of, of assassinating the czar, Tsar Alexander II. And he was thrown into prison as a result of that. Uh, before Necheyev's death, he wrote something, though, that's very significant about what he thought was his mission. He said the following, quote, The revolutionary man is a consecrated man. He has neither his own interests nor concerns, nor feelings, nor attachment, nor property, not even a name. All for him is absorbed in the single exclusive interest in the one thought, in one passion, revolution. End quote. And he died with that in mind. He died with revolution, with a mission in mind. A mission that included no concern for property, no concern for feelings, no concern for interests, just with one thing in mind. If there's one thing we ought to have in mind as followers of Jesus Christ, it's taking the gospel to the world no matter what it costs. That's what Jesus is asking us to do. This will only happen. Acts 1-8 will only happen if this plan is supplied by the surrendered, both those who will go and those who will stay. Or as R. Kent Hughes put it, he said, the Christian, if the Christian faith is worth believing, it's worth believing heroically. And I would add to that, if the Christian faith is worth living, it's worth living heroically. If the Christian faith is worth giving to, it's worth giving to heroically. If the Christian faith is worth spreading, it's worth spreading heroically. Because it's the difference between whether someone spends eternity in hell or in heaven. God wants our church to be a penetrating, evangelistic, outreach-oriented church. But that will only happen if that's true of all of us as individuals. Is that true of you today? The last words that Jesus spoke before ascending to heaven were, you shall be witnesses. What are you doing to be his witness? What are you doing to give to the witness of others? Don't say you can't. He says, I've given you the power. Don't tell God you don't know what to say. He's got an answer for that. You just say what happened to you. And maybe, maybe God will then also call you to go to the end of the earth to take the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, I praise you for the gospel. Thank you that somebody had the courage to, to tell my family that I could be saved. And I pray that, that there would be people in heaven someday because of my witness. And maybe that may that be true of every person here today that there will be people in heaven because they shared the gospel, that there will be people in heaven because they, they gave financially, that there will be people in heaven because we were the witnesses that you wanted us to be. Father, I pray that you'd give our church a passion for the lost of all races, of all backgrounds, of all lifestyles, and that we would share the gospel and they would be gloriously saved. Use us here in our Jerusalem, but also to the end of the earth. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.